Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. We are, uh, we just got back from a uh, meeting, not a meeting. What is it, engagement? Mm -hmm. With one of the bigger tech people here in Austin. Yeah. And uh, it was a lot of fun. We've got Whitney Webb later on on the show. Uh, talking about some things coming down the pike with the vaccine passport. And um, we met this dude through a mutual guy. He was a nice guy, brilliant guy, very smart, very successful. Um, when we walked in, I, he felt, I felt like he didn't really know us or knew who we were or what we did. Um, I think he only has a slightly better understanding of it after the two hours. But we played pickleball, which is a game. It's like uh, it's a cross between tennis and ping pong. And it's very interesting when you meet, like, high-powered, successful people. A lot of times they're like, do something athletic in front of me. Let's see if you can do something. Uh, do you have a competitive edge? Do you want to win? You know, it was like that kind of. They said there was going to be a lunch. We walked in. There was, like, hummus and a strawberry. So it was, like, not exactly. But that's fine. They're healthy. That's what they eat. You know what I mean? Tech, successful. It was a scene from Ex Machina is what it was. But it was lovely. It was lovely. And, um... You know, the house is, you know, tremendous and beautiful. And uh, and then they go, let's play some pickleball. Do you guys play pickleball? And I was like, I don't really know what it is, but I'm sure um, I will do it. And then um, it's a cross between tennis and ping pong. Mm -hmm. So you have, it's like a court in a gym and you're playing uh, pickleball. And um, me and Ben, of course, are going to play together. But then they said, well, you're both beginners. So you should play with the other people there. So we did. And it was... Now you look at me and you look at Ben and you're like, oh, Ben, he's going to be the athlete. Ben was so bad at this game. And he kept cheating by going into this area where you were not supposed to go into. Um, it was so embarrassing. Now they're in gym clothes. Me and Ben have jeans on because we didn't really know. It was raining. We didn't know it was going to happen. And um, I was doing pretty damn good. Like a few of the other people there were like, you're going to be really good at this. I had a great, you know, because I... I played tennis as a kid a little bit, and I, I know how to really just kind of hit the ball, just have it sail right over the net. Ben was aggressively, you know, we're playing doubles, and Ben was aggressively trying to, like, hit the ball in front of the other people and then just failing miserably at it. Did you know how bad you were doing? I charged the net a couple of times. It was embarrassing. Did you feel how how bad you were doing? I had a, a couple of. Were them you told me shocked? How good at, I was actually. Who told you that? Well, I can't say his name, but he he was not. <laughs> I was doing very well. You were great at serving, very good at. Serving. You know what? <laughs> you know what? See, this is what he's trying to do. I was doing really, really well. Okay, I do what I do well, and Ben likes to pretend he does everything well. I was, I'm an amazing server. And then I could also do the volley, but I also feel like after I've done the serve, I should be done for the point. <laughs> I don't want to run around the court like a psychopath. It's unbecoming of a man of my stature. So I do the serve, and then the other person runs around like a monkey. And then I was good at returning too. He's being a piece of shit because he was <laughs> he was genuinely embarrassing. And these are, these are really rich, successful people judging us. And the pig is murdering it Running around the court, doing what I have to do. Uh, and then the, this guy's uh, uh, family walked in, and then they were all staring there watching Ben just wildly run around. And it was so, it was hard to see. It was hard to see for me because I felt bad for Ben. I was embarrassed for Ben. We'd never done anything athletic before. Mm -hmm. And you, you thought you were thinking that I was just going to not be good at all. That's not true at all. That's what you felt. No, I know but you what were a swimmer and everything. Yeah. Pipe down. What happened was <laughs> I was phenomenal. I was pretty damn good. The guy looked at me and said, you are going to be very good at this. The other guy. The main guy said you were good. When did he say that? He actually said twice. He's like, wow, that was really impressive when I was up there. Like, I had a couple times where it was yeah, like Yeah, that's insane. one isolated thing. That's not a review of your performance for the entire day. Mm. It's what you did one or two good things. I don't think I missed a serve, though. Like, I didn't, I didn't hit a serve out of bounds, though. I, the were pretty I, good. I was just saying, between me and you, would you argue that I did a little better? Uh, oh, wow. Overall? Yeah, overall. You, you won more games. Well, that would be, that's, they care about winning. You understand? Mm -hmm. What metric are you deciding? I won more games. What metric are you going off of? 
Um, inner belief. Well, anyway. <laughs> After the game, uh, we hung out and ate uh, hummus. And it was nice. Some matcha. Delicious. Yeah, some matcha. It was uh, uh, lovely. Meeting new people here in uh, Austin, Texas. And, um, you know, we're not influenced by anyone ever on this show. We're never influenced. I'm ne I'm never in like I am never influenced by anyone on this show. Like I like I meet successful powerful people all the time. But I'm never like a guy who's like, "Oh, I should start evangelizing on the behalf of anyone." I never felt that. I've never felt that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I do and this is unrelated. This is a, an unrelated point. I was thinking this morning about what a great company Palantir is. <laughs> While I had my eggs. And I just, I woke up and I said, what a great mm -hmm. company it is. Because they have all the information of the people. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You want... You want all the information to be in a place. And I think that's, they do it good. They do it well. So I'm a fan of them. Yeah, great investment. The great investment. Yeah, yeah. I also would like to say, yeah. I like the Central Intelligence Agency. I like them. They're efficient. They're mysterious. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to relax when we are um, uh, always with the bringing up the bad things they did in the past. Enough with that. Stop that. There, everyone's made mistakes. When I was young, I kicked my friend. That wasn't becoming of my character. That's not who I am. So I like... The Central Intelligence Age. I like it. And I think it's good. And I don't think you should be upset if people want to listen to what you're saying on the phone. Or read your email. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it's a big deal if people know what medications you're on. And if they need to be refilled, I, I, I'm okay with that. And you should be too. I think we ask too many questions. Do you understand? I understand what you're saying. Yes. And I'm just saying I'm an independent broadcaster who has thoughts that are in his head that he says them. They are not given to me by anyone and they are not, I am not influenced by anyone. But God damn it, if Jeff Bezos isn't a great fucking guy. He's a great guy, and I, I want things to be delivered to me in, f with a drone. Right? Yes. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying those things, and only those things. Mark Zuckerberg gets a bad rap. He's a sweet boy who's created a thing that's a little wacky. Do you understand? Jack Dorsey's a fine man. He's a fine man. He's created a platform that makes me feel better about the world and our ability to have a meaningful dialogue. I love you, Jack. Do you understand? Whoever owns Patreon, I love them, the Patreon uh, people. You are good pe Hey, Eric Schmidt at Google. These are, I am just saying that I, lo I love people in tech. I like them. I think it's important that we get off their back. Get off their back. I like that they don't have a, an expression all the time on their face. I like that. I think that's nice. How many people do you meet where they have a, when you look at them, they have an expression and they go, 
hello, or and you see, oh, you're happy or you're sad or you're embarrassed. I like when there is none. I think it's refreshing. I think it's modern. I think it's modern. I think it's very modern when someone looks at you and does it, you can't quite tell if they are if they're real. I like that. I I enjoy that. That's what I like. You don't the people are so caught up in like, oh, I should be able to say what I want. I don't think so. I don't think so. I believe that you should get a list of words that you can say, which will be shorter than the ones that you cannot, and that'll make it easier for you. I, I'm just saying, I am saying that I'm, I am not, I have not been co-opted at all, okay? At all. I'm just saying that I'm, I want to get the vaccine more than twice. I'd like to get it six or seven times <laughs> is what I'm saying. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, oh, oh, you're in Texas and you're meeting all these uh, people and you're, you're, they're influencing you. No, no, that's not it. I'm realizing how lucky I am that there is an industry taking care of me, taking care of us all. They're taking care of us all. Thank the Lord. I like it. I like people pooping in the street. I don't think it's a big deal. I think if you, if, if you think it's a big deal, you should start a company and buy a house out of the city. But I think people should be able to poop in the street. Sorry. I'm a humanitarian. Okay? So I wanted to get that, that out of the way because people are always nervous how and, and when we'll be co-opted. So there's not, I just want to let people know there is no fear of that at all. No fear of that at all. Okay, let's do an ad break here. We do have, we do have an ad. Hold on, hold on. Let's get it. Let's get the ad here. The Tim Dillon Show is proud to be sponsored by the National Security Agency. The National Security Agency, we're watching out for you. Here at the NSA, we are pioneering new ways to make Americans safe. That is our top priority, keeping you safe by using many different ways to get information. It's not really important how we get the information. It's important we do with it what we think is best. The National Security Agency, we're the, we love you. All right, that was our first ad break. Let's do a second ad break because we roll into Moderna <laughs> as now sponsoring the Tim Dillon show. <laughs> Moderna has developed a vaccine. It is fun and it is two shots. You will love it and enjoy it. And afterwards, it will be shown that you have taken it in a wallet so you can get into basketball games and concerts. Moderna is always working hard to try to solve the problems of tomorrow. Just have to get these added out of the way, folks. It's just The Tim Dillon Show is proud to be sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> Bill and Melinda are here to help. They want you to know that. Bill has spent years tirelessly trying to solve every problem that has ever arisen from climate change to vaccines and diseases and overpopulation and how these all go together somehow. Bill and Melinda are very excited to help people through their charitable donations and foundations and contributions. On this show, I have said things about Bill that are not true because I am a stupid pig. Don't listen to the stupid pig. Do your own research at their website, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because that is where the accurate information is. All other sources are not to be trusted. I am sorry for what I have said about Bill and Melinda Gates. It was inappropriate and downright wrong. I wrestle with the guilt 
of what I have said about them. Sometimes it is so bad that I lay in bed all day like I have just taken the much-needed second shot of the Moderna vaccine. This ad copy is good. It's not bad. <laughs> I am very, very happy. I love Bill and everything he has done for the third world and our world Let's and all of the worlds. Bill and Melinda Gates, I am very sorry that I said that Warren Buffett was a creepy old goblin and that him and Bill were frauds and that they have a plan that if only we had any clue about it, it would scare us all. I apologize for that. I also apologize for continually bringing up the Epstein angle with Bill because Bill had no idea what Jeffrey was doing. I am a fat opportunist who likes to link people's, this is a long ad, who likes to link people together that had nothing to do with each other. It is because I am fat and I am not thinking clearly that I have constantly brought up previous associations with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I am sorry. I want to take this opportunity to apologize to B Bill, Melinda, and Warren Buffett for all of my transgressions. And I am excited to welcoming them as sponsors of my new show, where I will be vaccinated on the table <laughs> in front of everyone. So I think it's important that people tr know and trust us. You know what I mean? And that's because there's so many people out there right now in the entertainment business that are, you know, people don't trust them. But I feel like we have to kind of show everybody that just because we're in Austin and just because we know some of these people, we have not changed who we are, like our core beliefs and values, which have always been a, a deep love of the intelligence community. <laughs> and, and Big Pharma. Why are, you know, are you, do you people realize how lucky you are with the pharmaceuticals that you can get them when you are young and keep taking them for your entire life? Do you realize how lucky you are? Many people don't have the chance to begin a regimen of Adderall at three and then take uh, puberty blocking hormones at nine and then graduate to lithium at 12 and then keep going on a cocktail of different medications until uh, you're in a grave. It is so nice. I just want to throw that out there. I just want to throw that out there because I think I've been very hard on the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I've said that they're selling us junk cures for products, like, uh, you know, for problems that they've invented. And I want to say that I'm dead wrong. I am dead. Think of this. Everything I have said before today, I have been dead wrong. Dead wrong. And I realized that. I, I have realized that. I've been dead wrong. I think Chelsea Handler's doing a good job with her documentaries about uh, black people. I want more of them. I want more of her content. I, I believe in her and her mission. And if I've ever said anything on this show that makes people doubt that, it's because I'm a, a bad person. But I'm trying to get better at that. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Do you understand? Now, since we left this person's house, my cell phone has not worked. And I don't, I think that's a coincidence. Right? Yeah, probably. And there's something odd with my car. When I turn it on, it makes a weird sound. But I don't think that any of that is related. Do you think we'll be invited back? I hope so. They were lovely. They were very fun. I had a great time. What are the chances? I think 50%. 50 percent. Okay. 50. Okay. What do you think? Um, I don't know. I'll get better at pickleball in the meantime. But. I hope so. I just want to use this opportunity. 
Why are you? Why are you? I'm not. I'm not. I want to use this opportunity to talk about my love. My love for Elizabeth Holmes. She made one mistake, you know? One mistake. That's all. You know? Why are you all, you're all nervous now. I'm not nervous at all. Why are you all nervous? I'm not nervous. I don't know what you're talking about. You're very nervous. No, I'm not. You think they're going to kill you? <laughs> you think they'd kill you? You think they'd waste their time remotely hijacking your Tesla when you and your wife are going to get oysters at whatever dump is in Austin? You think they'd waste their time killing you? Are you, have you not lost your mind? If they're going to kill anyone, it's going to be me. I don't want anyone to kill you. That's true. Would not be good. <laughs> but I was, I was, I did all the ads that I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're going to have an issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think so? I enjoyed it, and I hope we're invited again. I love our new sponsors. I, I love our new friends. I, and I was wrong to question why Bill Gates wanted to shoot a missile of dust at the sun. That was a mistake. Mm. I'm sorry about that. I think, he, I think he should shoot a missile of whatever he wants at whatever he wants. I don't... You understand that? Mm. I want my audience to know... That I have integrity. Okay? Is there anything else we didn't cover? We're doing this Bitcoin conference. <laughs> we are doing this until that email comes in tomorrow. But we can't. We're doing it. When is it? Can you get the ad? This is a real ad. June. Oh, let's do that. Let's go right into an ad. Perfect. Yeah, right here. Here you go. What if I told you that Bitcoin is the future of money? Now what if I told you there's going to be an actual in-person, in-the-flesh event this year? Focus exclusively on Bitcoin, and it's going to be the biggest event in Bitcoin history. Now what if I continue to tell you that event will happen in Miami, Florida on June 4th and 5th, and that I, Tim Dillon, was going to be there too? Would you believe me? It's true. The Bitcoin 2021 conference is happening, folks. It'll be sunny, hot, Miami, Florida, June 4th or 5th. Headlining the conference will be Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter. Chamath, I palap. Bidia, he retweets us. We like him. Tony Hawk, who is a Bitcoiner. Michael Saylor, the dude who keeps taking out a billion dollar loans against his company to buy Bitcoin. And Nick Sabo, he's a fun guy on Twitter. Tim Dillon will also be considered a headliner if he does a good job with the ad read. Oh. There will be a whale day ahead of the conference. If you're rich like me, you need to buy a whale pass and get there a day earlier on June 3rd. There'll be Bitcoin powered. We don't even know what we're doing for this. No one's told us. No, no one will let us know. No one has told. Do you think they're just going to execute us in front of all these people? <laughs> no, we've emailed f nine times to figure out what's expected of us. We know we're doing a live podcast. We're doing a live podcast. And you're moderating something. I'm moderating something. There'll be Bitcoin powered arcade games, a massive art gallery with all the most famous Bitcoin artists, Tony Hawk is skating a half pipe and much more. An answer party that I'll be opening up for. I, I I don't even know what's happening here. This event will be the event of the year. It's going to sell out. Get your tickets now. Go to B slash TC. What? No, B. B dot TC slash conference. I'll put it on the screen right here. And it's, it'll be in the description. Yeah, go to B dot TC slash conference. Promo code Tim Dillon. 10% off your ticket price. Am I selling tickets to this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But am I getting anything from that? Well, you're getting paid to do the Bitcoin conference. Yeah, but I mean, that's <laughs> not what, that's not what I'm going to get people to come to this and then go. If you want to see, if you want to see me do a live pot, we have no idea what's going on or what we're doing. I mean, that's not the greatest sales pitch. 
but I genuinely don't know. We don't know, but it's going to be fun because mm. it's always fun. Yeah, yeah. But do you know what we're doing? Not a clue. Right. Neither, I don't know if your agent doesn't know. I don't know what's going on, but we will be in Miami. And we're going to do a live podcast, and then I'm moderating an event. And it looks like you might be doing stand-up at an after party or something. I don't know. No one has said anything about it. Come learn about Bitcoin and celebrate life and freedom at the Bitcoin 2021 conference. B.TC forward slash conference and use the code Tim Dillon 10% off. Jack Dorsey is going to be headlining on uh, Twitter. Is he a Bitcoiner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all are. They all are. It should be interesting. I mean, I'm wondering. I'm wondering how this is going to go. You know? Like, are we going to be podcasting in, like, a half pipe that Tony Hawk is, like, skating in? I don't know. I don't know <laughs> how this is going to go. You may want to come and see it to just see it. Because I genuinely do not have an idea. I, it'll be funny, mm -hmm. certainly. But I don't know... What's going to happen? This will be way more fun than a, like a comedy festival or something. 100%. Well, yeah, I am hoping. Yeah. I believe so. It's a real cultural moment. A live Tim Dillon show from the biggest Bitcoin conference. I mean, it's going to be wild. They're going to talk about everything, right? All the coins, Dogecoin. Mm. Uh, I'm wear I want to wear like a Dogecoin shirt. Well, this one might specifically just be for Bitcoin, it looks like, oh, okay. not crypto in general. But well, what if I have the Dogecoin dog on a shirt? Have a little fun. That could be a big hit, yeah. I mean, we got to figure something out here. We got to we gotta do something. So I'm thinking if we put him on the shirt, people can see we're putting the work in here. Mm -hmm. You know? What else can we do? Because that was my idea. Do you have any ideas you brought to the table? Well, my idea is I, I would like us to do the live podcast with Gary V. I think that would be amazing. It, Invitation to Gary V. If you if you allow me to I would love it. I would really like I don't know if he's gonna do it. If you know Gary, let him know that we'd like him as a guest. I will pay Gary V money to be on the show at the Bitcoin conference. It will be a lot of fun. Mm. It will be a lot like he could coach me as to how to like start a business. Mm. What I'd like to do is get Gary V and bring my friend Ryan, who's a recovering heroin addict, to the conference. And I'd like to have Gary instruct Ryan on how to start a business. That would be that would be my goal. If I could get Gary V to instruct my recovering heroin addict friend on how to build a brand. That would be my goal. But it is a weird, like, we don't, it's going to be interesting, but we don't know, we don't know what's going to happen. Are people going to sit and listen? I I, assume, I think it's like a TED Talk thing, but with Bitcoin, like, people are going to sit around talking talk I mean, about Bitcoin. but to our podcast. Yes. Yes, I believe so. We should get a guest. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to get? For the, well, my idea was Gary V. Um, I noted. I guess noted. Uh, another guest could be Lil Zan. Lil Zan. <laughs> Yo, like Bitcoin. But I'm dead serious. Shouldn't we have a guest? Mm -hmm. Who? You're the producer of this show. You went today and made a mess about pickleball. <laughs> you lied on the show and said I did. You mean you did nearly the same? We did not. You blew a lot of high high profile things. I blew a few of them, but you blew some serious. Up. And I had an amazing serve. People noticed that I had a skill set. Mm. Yeah, I was a little bit chaotic in my skill set. You were really all over the court, and you kept cheating. You kept going into the kitchen, which is the thing you shouldn't go into. That I was wearing Clark's though. If I was wearing tennis shoes, I could have stopped on time. Yeah, I mean, everyone's got a story, but you know. That area right by the net, you kept going into and cheating. Mm. What about Roseanne? Like, I'm dead serious. Oh, amazing. Can we fly Roseanne to the Bitcoin conference? From Hawaii? Sure. I, I don't know what we're going to... We got to do something here. 
I'm dead serious. Paying us money. We got to figure out something. Mm-hmm. What if we get Chamath to explain Bitcoin to Roseanne? Something like this has got to happen. I'm telling you, Mm. we need to get somebody who needs to explain Bitcoin to someone else who's completely off the planet. Mm. That's the fusion I want to make. I want to make this happen. I want to take a Bitcoin expert. Maybe I'll just get one of my friends who's like from Long Island who's just completely shot. I don't know. But that's what needs to happen here. Whitney Webb is coming up. She's going to be here to discuss getting thrown off of Patreon. Why that happened. She's also going to talk about vaccine passports, why she's skeptical that the Maxwell new charges mean much. We told her we'd have her back if the Maxwell thing goes to trial, which we don't know if it will or not. It's supposed to in July, yeah. We'll also be, th- the, uh, we got uh, an episode with Stan Hope on the Patreon right now, the higher tier, because we, we kind of fucked them over. We didn't mean to. And we were going to do a big, long episode with Doug and put it out this week, but it just didn't work. It just kind of went off the rails at the end. It was like, this was what we could do here. We can't, you know. Um, but we'll be back there. Mm-hmm. Lovely people. Love them both. Doug and Bingo. Um, we'll be back there. Uh, so we got that rocking and rolling. We got live dates. A lot of them are sold out. The majority of them are sold out. Um, and we got more being announced all the time. The world's opening up and, uh, we're out there having a lot of fun or just doing what we have to do as a job. You choose your choice. Some of it is fun, but you know, I hope this is fun. What about AJ? AJ. I was kind of thinking that, or like maybe even, you know. They're shutting Alex Jones down. They're not letting that happen. Because what about if Alex Jones, like, charged Jack Dorsey (laughs) on stage? He's like, you motherfucker. And Jack Dorsey's like, who the fuck (laughs) brought Alex Jones? And it's like, oh, the comedian that we hired. It would be really cool if we, like, snuck Alex in. He stayed at our hotel. And we got him like to enter the back door. He just like like the Kool Aid Man just popped into the conference. Yeah. Well, now that we've yeah, <laughs> no one will figure that out now. You just put that plan out there, dumb dumb. Well, no, I mean it's it's clearly it's clearly a, a situation where I w- we need to bring in a guest. Who else? You said Alex, and then you were thinking of somebody else. Oh, um, um, maybe someone's. Like I was thinking, like not just like Maxwell, of course, because she's not on bail. But I'm trying to think of someone. We also can't talk to a human trafficker for goofs. <laughs> we can't bring on a human trafficker for a bit. People would get angry at that, and rightly so. Like yucking it up with Ghislaine Maxwell, who's tortured children. There's got to be some line. What about Rogan? Should I email Rogan? Text him? Email him a formal offer? <laughs> tell him we'll pay him fifteen hundred dollars to appear. <laughs> Hear me out. Okay. Hear me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear me out. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you ready? hmm Do you know what I'm about to say? No. How well do you know me? Very well. Almost as well as anybody. Probably better than anyone. That's exactly right. Yeah. Who am I going to say? What about Eric Weinstein. Oh, fuck. Come on. <laughs> In a world. Why not? That would be the absolute perfect gag, yeah, perfect guest. Why not? How about Eric, Brett, Heather? Eric, Brett, Heather, Jordan Peterson, Michaela Peterson, Sam Harris, Barry Weiss. <laughs> Roxanne Gay. What about Roxanne Gay? I don't know. I don't know anymore. What if we just had the wine scenes on and we talked about trans people for three hours? People are like, what does this have to do with Bitcoin? 
Talk about the corn. We're getting tackled. <laughs> We're like puberty blockers. They're like, talk about the fucking corn. We're here to make money. <laughs> we should talk about what a great troll to talk about something completely unrelated. Mm. <laughs> There's something that has nothing to do with it. We just talking about the Kennedy assassination for an hour. <laughs> they go, yeah, that was not the room for that. They really went off the rails. We just, what if we bring Sharon Osbourne in and get her drunk and have her just fucking go crazy shouting Asian slurs? Amazing. You know these motherfucking wontons, motherfucking people. <laughs> Piers Morgan. Mm -hmm. John McAfee. He's not going to step on the <laughs> U.S. soil, right? Yeah, he's like still on the run. Steve Bannon could be interesting too. Steve Bannon at a bit. Now, that'll be a major story if he would do it. The conference people would probably get mad. They don't want to politicize it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're friends with him. I, I have no idea. They probably are behind closed doors, mm -hmm. but in front of those doors, they're going to act like you have no idea who he is. All these billionaires stopped pretending they didn't know who Trump was when he got elected. It's like, wait, what? Um, Matt Gates. What about Matt Gates? What about Donald Trump Jr.? <laughs> DT June. I think he'd do it. I'm trying to think who we could get that would actually be good for like for the show. Mm -hmm. What if we had like we it's gotta be someone in that world. Well, yeah, I mean, if John McAfee can step on U.S. soil, he would be legendary if we gave him some white Russians and just let him go. Right. He's amazing. Right. Well, anyway, as you can tell, we've we've planned out a real big, great event, and we've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. So go to b.tc slash conference. That's all fake. We know exactly what we're doing. It's going to be amazing. B.tc forward slash conference. Use the code Tim Dillon for 10% off. Sheath underwear is great. It works as underwear and a bathing suit. Go to sheathunderwear.com. The owner of Sheath Underwear, the founder of Sheath Underwear, was um, a soldier. And I like to support businesses of the troops. And um, it ha they have a flexible pillowcase for your junk. It's literally all I wear. They're the best. You have to try it yourself. Give them a Google, sheathunderwear.com. The inventor, Robert Patron, mm -hmm. check the story. It's interesting and even somewhat inspiring. It is inspiring. It really is. Do you know the sheath underwear story? No. Robert was uh, in the service. I forget which branch, Marines or something. Maybe not. Maybe Army. I don't know. He went to Iraq. He went, he had like three tours or four or something crazy three or four tours in Iraq. And then he came home and he had a little PTSD and he murdered his wife and his kids. He murdered his wife and his two children. And then he started this underwear company and it, it's so comfortable to me that I don't know why anyone wears anything else. He bludgeoned them. He bludgeoned his wife in front of the children first. And then he said he couldn't live with uh, the types of people that they would grow up to be. So he killed both of them. This is sad, but this is common and this is what happens. But this is what heroes sometimes do. And he killed his family. And then he started an underwear company. And it is really great. And it's because it cradles your junk in a very good way. You know? He learned about the importance of underwear when he was organizing um, the warlords in Afghanistan who like to fuck lady boys in Afghanistan, many of them children. He learned about the importance of underwear because uh, the climate in Afghanistan is very interesting. It's very hilly. The only thing that grows there is opium. And they, they would walk around a lot and they would chafe. Their junk would chafe. And they wanted their junk to be nice for when they just submerged it into the child lady boys that uh, are running around Afghanistan and we were organizing the warlords to overthrow the Taliban because the warlords, even though they were pedophile opium farmers, we felt that they would construct a, a successful democracy in uh, Afghanistan. So the warlords had gone to Robert and said, we 
need to cradle our junk so we could continue fucking these lady boys uh, in tents and so that, because it's what we do, and then we can uh, start work on roads and bridges and a library. So he learned about underwear from them. He also learned about underwear uh, when a lot of, it was so hot in Guantanamo Bay, they used to put people in like a hot box and it would be so hot. And the guards that would have to check on them would say, hey man, so much sweat, you know, the balls are sticking to my leg. Uh, when I see, I, I got to check on this guy every three minutes to see if we've killed him. And then he'd go, why is that guy even in here? He'd go, I don't know. And he goes, he goes, but I need underwear to cradle my junk. You see? He also learned about under underwear uh, the day after he shot Benazar Budo in the face. After he shot Benazar Budo in the face, he learned he was sitting in a cafe in Karachi, Pakistan, and he said, I wish something would cradle my junk right now. And one of the Afghani warlords was like, we can get a child to do it. He's like, no, no, no I'm not into that. So they said, uh, you should uh, invent an underwear. I'm doing the ad the way they want. I'm just, hey, I'm just following orders. Sheathunderwear.com, 20% off. Use the code Tim. <laughs> <laughs> we have to say that. <laughs> we have to say that. Okay, now Whitney Webb. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Uh, returning favorite. Uh, she is the tech community's favorite reporter. When are you going to win that award? When are they all going to get together and give you an award uh, for being the, the tech community's favorite reporter? Uh, <laughs> From an undisclosed location, Whitney Webb, you're now I want to go into this with you first. What happened with Patreon? Oh man. Okay, so that was going on actually while I was moving countries. So I just left Chile for the first time in like six years. Uh, and I'm going to live somewhere else now. And why all of that was ha happening, uh, Patreon sent me an email saying um, I was going, my account was set to be suspended if I didn't delete certain posts. Um, for medical misinformation, they said, but they have, it's like a scripted email. So they had, uh, here are the examples of misinformation we found on your page, and they left it blank for me. Um, I actually tweeted this out. Other people that had um, gotten this email from Patreon had had like links, examples of the alleged misinformation on their page provided to them. Uh, they left mine blank. <laughs> so I responded and asked, and they provided links and instead the things that had never been posted on Patreon but things that had been posted on my website, Unlimited Hangout, including some that I'd never even written, claiming that uh, Patreon's community guidelines apply to my personal website. So um, wait a minute. Because mm -hmm. they, they sent you links from articles, some of them that you wrote, but some of them that other people had wrote? Yeah, that were on just my website. And mm -hmm. they were saying if you don't delete those articles, then... Yeah. You're off Patreon. Yes, and I am off Patreon because I'm not going to delete them because there's nothing factually wrong with them. Right. Uh, and they, you know, declined to say what was wrong about the articles. Uh, you know, on their website, on Patreon's website, the only examples of medical and misinformation they're going to censor for are things like drink, telling people to drink bleach and telling people that UV light is the same as a COVID-19 vaccine and stuff that, like, you know, I would never say on my site and stuff like that, but um, I'm not the only one that got censored uh, in this way. Like James Corbett of the Corbett Report and Ryan Christiana, the last American vagabond, were also taken down uh, under this new policy. Uh, James Corbett especially, you know, cites literally everything he says and has never been wrong uh, and never had to retract anything. So it's really amazing uh, that they went after him as well. But all of this is about um, any sort of reports that were critical of the vaccine. So in the case of, uh, in, in my particular case with Patreon, they were most uh, unhappy about an article about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that I wrote in December. And, you know, fast forward a couple months, I mean, I think it's over 20 countries now that are no longer using that vaccine because of safety concerns. And that article was about how the people that developed that vaccine have a history 
um, of doing really shady things in their safety trials, and including this one, but I was talking you know, about, about past examples. Um, and also the fact that one of the developers of that vaccine is, uh, uh, gave a speech and is deeply uh, connected to individuals that are part of something called the Galton Institute in the United Kingdom, which is the renamed British Eugenics uh, Society. They used to be the Eugenics Society until 1989, I guess thinking that having eugenics in your name was fine. <laughs> I, like, I liked it until 1990. They were yeah. like, we're still going with this eugenics name <laughs> because maybe yeah. there'll be a turn in public opinion. Right. And, and But they named it Galton after Francis Galton, who's the guy that came up with eugenics and talked about how there's a need to improve racial stock in the West and all of this stuff. So, you know, they're apparently still fine with it. So I thought it would be, you know, it's obviously newsworthy, the guy developing this vaccine uh, that they were marketing specifically uh, through COVAX and to, you know, um, like third world countries and stuff like that was the one that was being developed by a guy with links to this institute and that had this, uh, you know, a questionable track record. I mean, everything there is like sourced exactly where I get it from, you know, like all of my articles. So yeah, it's ironic. Just- it's ironic to say the least that this gentleman is behind the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. And that was yeah. the article that they had a problem with. Yes. Uh, but they wouldn't say what was factually inaccurate. And in their original email, they didn't say, they didn't even give me an example of misinformation. They just sent me the notice um, saying that I was going to be uh, suspended and deplatformed. Um, and, you know, um, obviously uh, that has an, a, an impact on what I do. Um, you know, for most of last year until I saw the writing on the wall a little bit with Patreon and, and created a, a backup, you know, to be able to uh, financially support myself and, and my website, you know, if I hadn't done that, uh, last year, you know, Patreon doing this would have completely shut me down. So, well, we um, want we want you to plug that right now. Where can people go and support uh, you now? Uh, well, since Patreon shut down for people that don't want to use the main alternative I've been using, which is uh, Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N, um, where I have my podcast and, and some other stuff um, directly through my website on, on Unlimited Hangout. We basically set up a uh, a Patreon equivalent, like on the site. So there's like, you can, there's posts and it's sort of like a forum thing and you can comment, uh, that you can join by signing up with really like any amount for like a monthly thing, just like Patreon. Yeah. There's Um, something very strange about Patreon censoring people for off platform activities, meaning that it's not necessarily what you did on Patreon. It's an article on a website. Did they give you a time limit? Did they say you have 48 hours to delete? No, just kept following emails, uh, like one or two being like, just wanted to see if you've deleted those articles yet. And then when you don't delete them, they say, oh, well, I've suspended your page. Um, and then, you know, it goes, it goes away. Right. Um, but, well, you know, this is a really yeah. insidious form of censorship because it's, it's attacking the finances of the content creators directly um, as a way to try and prevent us from being able to, you know, uh, do this professionally, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, listen, it's, uh, we're the fourth biggest show on Patreon and, 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 and I am the, we are number four, right, Ben? That's correct, yeah. And I am in the world, right? I, think, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and I'm highly critical and I don't have any direct contact with them. Do you ever speak to them? They don't let me talk to anyone. It's a very good idea. Ben handles everything because when I talk to people, I mean, you think you think you were thrown off quickly. They've been very polite to me. They've been very kind. Very we nice. bring in a lot of money over there, but I'm highly critical of what they've done, and especially in your case. Like, that to me, you're not – I think what they're trying to say is – your articles are going to, uh, you know, make people less likely to get vaccinated. Now, here's the reality. People have to have access to information. The people are going to have to make decisions based on that. Um, if they can point out factually where you are lying or misrepresenting something or uh, slandering someone, but if, if they cannot show that there are that there are like lies or distortions in your article and you're just giving facts that are uncomfortable that they may not like to then remove you from earning an income. That is to me, not the right thing to do. Well, one of their follow-up emails after I challenged them on some of the, the stuff they said was that they didn't necessarily find misinformation in the article, but that the article, uh, 
may have dissuaded my audience from taking what they call the preventative countermeasures to, um, you know, uh, um, go again, um, you know, uh, counter the pandemic or whatever. Now, um, so they were basically saying yeah. they didn't like how people may react to the information in there. Not that it was necessarily wrong. Well, that is the any, argument uh, that they are making. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people online are making is that people, um, I mean, this is the big question, right? We all know there's misinformation online all over the place. But then if we censor everybody, who decides what information we get and how we get it? And then it's usually the same people that told us the Iraq war was a great idea, which I believed, but I was on cocaine at the time. Um, and they, and these are the same people that told us that, uh, you know, uh, that it was a great idea to set up a labyrinth of secret torture prisons, that that was necessary for our safety, that the Patriot Act was necessary. All these, whether it's the New York Times or the big three networks, like they are, they still want to control the information. And now it's those tech companies that are stepping in in place of these broadcast networks. It is now tech that wants to control what information we get and what information we yeah. don't get. But here's the thing, you know, if your public health measure is largely your your campaign around it is largely based around coercion, that is necessary. That That's going to lend itself to people being hesitant about partaking in it. Right? And you're saying that so 20 it, countries now don't use the AstraZeneca vaccine. Well, yeah. Um, or some of them suspended it for particular age groups like under uh, people under 50 years old aren't going to be taking it anymore and stuff like that. But there have been a lot of safety concerns that came out that didn't show up in the safety trials that were also after my article criticized by mainstream media outlets because they weren't conducted uh, well and they were sped through or the, the data was manipulated. I mean, all of this is public record, but I guess if you put, you know, you aggregate all of that negative information and you put it together, you know, I, it may have a different effect than just one, you know, mainstream media report on one case. This is uh, what happens that, with you know? your work a lot. You'll write something and then six months later when it's safe, the media will write about it. And it could uh, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it it, it happens that way. Uh, but you know, a lot of times, uh, people wait to speak up about something until they feel it's safe and it won't necessarily impact their career. Um, you know, if they're a journalist coming at this from you know sort of the careerist pers perspective, hoping to ascend up the ladder. But really, at right. this point, at least the way I'm looking at the world, you know, this information has to come out now um, because yeah. uh, of not just of the censorship environment, but where things are heading. Now, um, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, the, the what I what I the hot issue now is the vaccine passport. This is the big issue that everybody's talking about. Uh, Naomi Wolf was on Tucker Carlson and she was talking about, now she's a feminist writer, Naomi Wolf, right? Yes. Yes, yes, she is. Um, I always mix her up with the other Naomi, Naomi Klein, but it's Naomi Wolf was on Tucker Carlson talking about this and saying this is much more than just a vaccine passport. And I wanted you to yeah. talk about that because I know that you've looked into this and it's a contentious issue. There are some people that dismiss any concerns about it and go, anybody that has any questions about a vaccine passport is a lunatic and shouldn't be listened to. And then there are people uh, uh, where where I am, where I go, I don't really know what a vaccine passport is. I don't know that I trust people to tell me what it is. In your estimation, what is a vaccine passport and how could it be used? Okay, so what we need to understand about the vaccine passports they're promoting now is that they were never, they're not intended to stop with being vaccine passports. It's something that's going to be much more expansive and extensive if it gets its foot in the door. So um, back in January, I wrote about something called the Vaccine Credential Initiative, um, a public-private partnership uh, with uh, Microsoft, Oracle, Salesforce, uh, the MITRE Corporation, a U.S. government contractor, all coming together to create the framework for vaccine passports, of course, a couple months before there's this big public uh, push, but they called them smart health cards and called them vaccine wallets. Um, and this is basically the, the framework that a lot of these passports at some point will be um, running on. Some of the ones in, in use are already uh, running on this, this protocol. It's interesting they call it a wallet because the developer of this, uh, this framework at Microsoft talks about how you may need to show your vaccine passport to be able to rent a car. 
um, someday in the future. And of course, them using the term wallet uh, implies that this is going to move into economic activity at some point. And if you look at, for example, Bill Gates's Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, they've already partnered with MasterCard uh, to combine uh, MasterCard's digital payment service with Gavi's a digital uh, vaccine card, and they're currently piling that in Africa, uh, the Gabby MasterCard thing in combination with a company called uh, Trust Stamp, which is biometric identity. So basically what these vaccine passports are intended to be is uh, a, digi a digitized vaccine record uh, plus a digital wallet and then a biometric ID all in one. Yeah, why is, really is the why is MasterCard <laughs> involved? I mean, call me ignorant here, and many have. But why is MasterCard involved with a vaccine passport? What? Why would you need any type of financial? Like, why would they need any of your financial information? That confuses me. It's a partnership to have everything moved to these mobile-based uh, systems, I guess, where it's a, it's a biometric ID that gives you access to your money, through your by providing your biometrics, your face, your fingerprint, or whatever, and then also has uh, a vaccine your your vaccine registry. But really, it's not intended to stop at vaccine registry. It's intended to be your electronic health records and basically have it all uh, be there tied up together. And if you actually go and look at the vaccine cred credential initiative and the stuff they talk about and their partners talk about, I mean, it's really obvious that this has been the plan. Um, from the beginning. And, you know, this Gavi MasterCard partnership is just one, uh, but it's worth pointing out that a lot of these same actors, including MasterCard, are part of something called the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, uh, which is uh, supposedly headed by the Pope, but has uh, MasterCard and Visa and some of the biggest uh, companies in the world. Wait a minute, uh, there's a there. council for inclusive activism, uh, capitalism, and capitalism, headed by the, it. wait a minute, headed yes. by the Pope? Yes, uh, officially, and it's about redesigning um, a new system, a new economic system uh, for everyone in the world under the moral guidance of the Pope. Uh, yeah, and so you have the CEOs of all these really, it's really insane. So, um, <laughs> I mean, but, um, when did that better. get going? Well, it gets better. It yeah. really does. So you know, some of the people on there are Lynn Forrest or DeRothschild, the Jeffrey Epstein, Bill Clinton pal is yeah. on there reimagining capitalism for everyone. Um, and then you have the Lauder family from Estee Lauder, like Ron Lauder. Yeah. He's one of these mega group billionaire guys that I wrote about in the Epstein series and stuff. So like they're on So there. it's, you know, it's funny. It's reimagining capitalism, but it's people that capitalism's worked very well for. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, why would yeah. they want to really reimagine capitalism? They're doing quite well. Well, this is about the stakeholder capitalism idea that has come in, that has come out from the World Economic Forum, and that this Pope-led council is is promoting. And basically, what they want is, uh, you know, basically global public-private partnership to be the model of governance globally. Um, and of course, public-private partnership basically means. You know, the public and private fuse together. Uh, there's another word for that that has been used historically, but this is what they're going around promoting and saying that it will, uh, uh, but under the guise of it being called stakeholder capitalism. What's the, so I mean, now you, what's the, what's the pro word that's been used historically? Fascism? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, when you merge the public and private <laughs> sectors uh, and you basically well, have one entity that is the power that you cannot challenge and has a monopoly on force and, right. and the production of goods and everything right. else. I mean, Chris Hedges know, calls it the corporate state. And he said it's the most powerful force in the world is the corporate state. It's mega corporations fused with the national security state. Good luck. Like, good luck, you know, penetrating that. I just love this idea of a council led by the Pope uh, to reimagine yeah. capitalism with all these billionaires on it. Um, North Bands makes the most interesting and unique men's and women's rings. These are great rings if you want to get someone a gift or get them for yourself. They've been handcrafting rings for 10 years and take great pride in our quality and design. We make rings from the following unique materials, meteorite, whiskey barrel, ironwood, Natural shed elk and deer antler, titanium and tungsten carbonite, Damascus steel. That's a Game of Thrones stuff. Black and acid washed and many more. The rings are dreamt up, made and assembled in the USA. This company has over 2,000 five-star reviews. Every single purchase includes a free North Band silicone activity band and a North Band's wooden ring box. We offer ring sizers so you can get sized at home. I like jewelry. 
Do you have anything to say about that? I, I like jewelry too. See, I'm wearing a wedding ring. It's very important that you have a ring and that it is made of something cool, like meteorite. How much better would your life be if you could go, I have a meteorite ring on my ring finger? Amazing. And, or Damascus steel. Imagine that you said, I like your ring. What's that made of? And somebody goes, Damascus steel. I mean, what else do you want? They offer ring sizers so you can get sized at home. Whether you want a wedding band, anniversary band, or you just want a ring that looks awesome, head over to northbands.com. Use the promo code TIM. You get 20% off your purchase. In all seriousness, if you want to, if you are a ring person or you want to get someone a ring, this is a cool gift. It really is. People dig it, especially if you tell them it was made from meteorite or deer antler. What do you get for your uncle? You get him a deer antler ring. 20% off. That's N-O-R-T-H-B-A-N-D-S dot com. Use promo code Tim to get 20% off a truly unique ring. If you're a fellow whose resting body temperature rivals that of Las Vegas pavement in mid-July, standard antiperspirants probably don't give you much relief. But before you resign yourself to a life of perpetual pit stains, knew, know this. Duke Cannon Dry Ice Cooling Antiperspirant is made for guys who run uncomfortably hot. Its moisture and friction activated cooling system is just formulated with menthol to give you the all-day sensation of standing under an air conditioner cranked to high, not a heat lamp stuck on broil. Available in refreshing menthol and eucalyptus and peppermint and musk scents, Dry Ice uses activated charcoal to effectively combat sweat and stank, and with the highest level of odor and wetness protection available, you'll last longer in the heat, and your shirts will too. There are so many products to choose from. Dry ice, cooling, antiperspirant, menthol, and eucalyptus. Menthol delivers instant cooling, crisp peppermint and musk scent, enriched with activated charcoal to remove toxins while deodorizing. Moisture and friction activated cooling system keeps you cool, highest allowable sweat protection. I'm telling you about a good deal here. If you go to DukeCannon.com and use promo code Dylan for 10% off your next order, go to DukeCannon.com, use promo code D-I-L-L-O-N for 10% off your next order. Plus, get free shipping with orders over $20. A curated collection of Duke Cannon products are also available at select Target stores. So if you're at Target, like Dan Carney goes to, uh, you can grab it. How fun! Now, these vaccine passports, um, when they roll out, if they roll out, I imagine they're coming. It doesn't seem like there's much of a fight here. I imagine they're coming. They're going to have information about your health records, your any sickness that you may have had, your mental uh, health, if you've spent yeah. time in, uh, you know, any medications you're is, taking. This is farther, farther down the line. I mean, they're going to start off with less information first, but they admit that these, these initial ones um, are just a starting point. They plan to expand it later. If you go and watch the people that designed the, the frameworks and, and protocols that all this stuff is going to run on, uh, they, they basically tell you what the intention is. So, you know, first off with the COVID-19 vaccination, you know, it's this little paper card. It doesn't look very threatening. And now they're talking about you need a vaccine passport. Well, they're already saying people are going to fake vaccine, paper vaccine cards and paper vaccine passports. We need to tie it to biometric identity. They're already saying that we have to combine it with that before they even rolled out the vaccine. So like a passport. retinal eye scan. Little retinal well, eye scan. Not necessarily, okay. but facial recognition is really pretty ubiquitous in, in the U.S. and Western world. Uh, I mean, most people, a lot of people, unlock their phones with their faces now. I do. Know, so yeah, we all do. Most of us do. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't, but some people. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they know who you are anyway, don't I Yeah, mean, I know. I mean, uh, that's not why I just feel like I'd feel bad if I did it, you know, considering what I write about. And then no, of course. Of I get face. it. I so, get it. I just you know. I just hate typing in that little code. That So this becomes part of the problem. <laughs> part of the problem is I love what you write about, but it just, it feels like the weird, and I want you to keep writing about it, but it does feel like we're going to lose. I do feel like if it's a council of people led by the Pope, and the Louders, and the Rothschilds, I, me and my friends are gonna lose. What gives you any hope? Does anything give you any hope ever? 
Uh, yeah, well, I think there is actually going to be a lot of resistance to that. And I yeah. think uh, to this, I think it's important to keep in mind that what you're seeing on social media, what you see on mainstream news and the news in general is so manipulated to make you think a certain way. I mean, so are the polls. So, for example, in the UK, um, they were saying a vast majority of the public supports vaccine passports. Uh, and it turns out the polling company called Ipsos Mori, its CEO is part of the World Economic Forum, and they recently received almost three million pounds in funding from Bill Gates. So, you know, those are two big backers of vaccine passports. That company is a conflict of interest to manufacture consent for vaccine passports. And we know that they've like manipulated polls for public opinion in the past. I mean, the 2016 election, all the polls were wrong and said Hillary was going to win. She didn't win. Right. So there's like this huge effort underway to manipulate public opinion to right. get us to go along with this, but also to make us think that, uh, you know, if we don't want to go along with it, we're the minority. Right. And people are uneasy okay. about this. If you talk to a lot of people, they're uneasy about the idea of vaccine passports. They're uneasy about this stuff. And they are really open well, they should be. and they should be and they're they open to be. questioning it and they are questioning it privately. People aren't questioning it publicly for fear of like retribution. Um, Biden's new secretary of health or uh, not secretary of health, someone in the Biden administration, uh, Epstein funded or a buddy of Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Who so, um, it's the, uh, it's the white house office of science and technology. Um, and for the first time Biden, because he, you know, is going to be the administration of we believe science or whatever is going to elevate this post to be a cabinet level position where, which it's never been before. So basically it's going to, he's going to be, uh, the, per, the person in this post is going to be elevated to, you know, a secretary of, uh, defense secretary of health, you know, a cabinet level position. Um, and yeah, this guy that they've nominated is a man named Eric Lander, who leads the Broad Institute, which is basically, um, MIT and Harvard and Silicon Valley uh, figuring how they can harvest as much biometric data from you uh, and use it to train AI and all of this stuff. Um, but Eric Lander before then, you know, was photographed meeting with Epstein, uh, Jeffrey Epstein Bragg on his website about funding his work, uh, and he has never been held to account for it. Right. And now he's about to be nominated to the highest science post in the land of, uh, of, of an administration that says, we're going to do whatever the scientists say. And this is the scientists that they're putting in their top post, a man that was funded uh, by Jeffrey Epstein and, and denies it and lies about it, despite there being evidence to the contrary. And mainstream media has like not mentioned it at all. Um, and I am worried that if more people don't know about this, they won't even question him about Epstein at the confirmation hearing, which would be just. I imagine they, I imagine they won't. What do you think about these new charges, uh, which is Lane? Somebody's saying that she's now finally being charged with sex trafficking a minor, and they've expanded the scope of the inquiry into uh, other periods of time that could be more damning yeah. to people. Does so that? Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm, uh, I'm a little skeptical, uh, just because I really think uh, the more you look into the Epstein case, you know, I'm writing a book about it. Uh, the, the deeper you go into it, the more obvious it is they can't really let Ghislaine. Uh, go to trial or at least they can't have the trial be as extensive in certain periods uh, because they're going to incriminate themselves really um you know as i've talked about before and in my series uh the fbi uh the national security uh, the intelligence communities you know uh of the united states were knew what epstein was doing and were involved with him to um in an extent that really uh, needs to be you know well understood by people so you're basically having you know, a lot of the same entities that previously worked with Epstein and Ghislaine or helped protect them. Now prosecuting them, they're not going to get their hands too dirty because it can, it will make them look dirty if too much information comes out. So, um, um, I'm trying, there's been a couple new cases that have come out or a couple new claims in the Epstein case in general, not just with Ghislaine. Um, I've had, uh, some of the Epstein victims that I'm in communication with have expressed a lot of skepticism, at least about this one that said that she was almost, uh, Epstein threatened to feed her to alligators and, and all of this stuff that was recently reported on, uh, by the, I think the Miami Herald, uh, they were pretty skeptical about it. Just saying that the, the behaviors subscribed to Epstein there didn't really match up. Um, at all. And this has happened before because there are some people that think that they can, you know, make money um, out of this whole uh, scandal. You know, there's a lot of uh, grift related to Epstein uh, that tries to profit off of his victims um, and, and things like that. And um, there have been people in the past that, you know, it was pretty obvious they made up their encounters with Epstein based on uh, um, saying things that he, uh, everyone he knew, friend or victim or whoever, 
uh, said he would never do and never had had done and stuff like that. So, you know, some of these newer cases, they've expressed skepticism right. um, about what's what's going on here. And, you know, um, I think these late, uh, latest charges against Ghislaine was because uh, just because of how the uh, SDNY prosecutors had constructed her case up to that point. Her lawyers were apparently in a position to potentially get the whole case dropped, which would have been super scandalous uh, for the SCNY and definitely led to a lot of uh, not necessarily public unrest in the streets, but them getting a lot of heat and a lot of angry people about their handling of that case if, if that had come to pass. So I think they did have to sort of slap her with um, with bigger charges because last time, uh, well, I came on your show after she was arrested and we talked about it a little bit. I noted how in the indictment they admitted that she sexually assaulted uh, the victims in, in that indictment, They but they didn't charge her with sexual assault. Uh, right. Why would you not charge her for that? So right. I guess, you know, they would slay, save those charges uh, for later and here they are now. Um, when is but, her trial, you know, when is her trial scheduled to happen? Do we know? Um, I think it's in the beginning of July. I think it's, I, I can't remember the exact date. I'd have to go back in and check. I have a couple months, right? So You have <laughs> a couple been, months. When do you totally think your book is, are you going to, are you waiting for her trial to, uh, to, to add to the book? Or are you trying to, is the book mainly about what happened before they were caught? So it, it, it's mainly about what happened before, but new information is coming uh, out all the time. And I'm actually worried they're going to start censoring Epstein related information from the internet as we get closer to the trial. So I'm just trying to like amass a lot of um, <clears throat> information about particular things uh, before they can do that because the censorship um, is really bad. And I think they want to, um, you know, it's not just bury people talking about um, current stories and current events on YouTube or wherever, but they actually want to go back and censor things like the way back machine that they've already started um, messing with and, and things like that. Um, as far as my, uh, when the book comes out, um, it's, it's currently scheduled to come out just a couple days before the trial, but because of, uh, I had to move across countries and the situation in Chile before I left was really crazy. So I couldn't even get childcare uh, because of what's going on there. So, um, right, so you had I to may go. have to, uh, delay it a little bit, but we, you know, I'll be making, well, I'm living in Austin, Texas now, and you're always welcome to come here and visit and all of your friends are oh, here. Thanks. Every day a new tech <laughs> company moves down here, so maybe we could get you a few speaking gigs. All, <laughs> All right, right, so right, it's Rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N, Rockfin, mm -hmm. and also what is the website? UnlimitedHangout.com, Whitney mm -hmm. Webb, off Patreon. We're not happy about that. Not much we could do about it other than say go uh, support Whitney if you enjoy her work. She's written the best articles about Epstein and about a lot of different things. And you go into territory that people are afraid to go in to. And that you're like a muck raking journalist. That's what you do. You rake up muck. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess so. Um, I definitely rake up muck and try and tell people about it and uh, about all the muck, you know, whatever right. I find, I just, I put out there in the article. I mean, it's up to people, I think, to draw their own conclusions. Yeah, um, and, stuff. and to me, as long as you're not distorting things factually, I don't, I mean, to remove you off the platform for an off-platform activity that was not uh, a bunch of distortions, it was here is factual reporting that may be uncomfortable and people may draw their conclusions. It's very interesting to penalize somebody based on the conclusions their audience might draw from an article. That gets as yeah, close to th thought crime as you can get. But it's also in a way, you know, uh, criminalization, I guess, in a sense, or uh, sending the message that you will be censored for criticizing a product of big pharma, really, um, because basically the vaccine here is a product. So what if they apply this to other things um, at some point? You can't criticize this. Right. Uh, you know, I've always talked that about that. I, I've always industry. said that it's very interesting. You know, the financial industry, they had Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff was this guy that supposedly, uh, he's, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald, he's a lone wolf that existed unto himself. And, you know, it's there's no comment about the larger yeah. system. It's Bernie. And now we have the Sackler family who's, you know, uh, uh, made Oxycontin. And everybody goes, the Sacklers and Oxycontin. And listen, they're demons, no doubt. But the idea that it's like this one family that we can isolate and draw a line around them and go, they're the problem. It was Bernie Madoff or it was the Sackler family and criticism of 
anybody else in pharma means you're a hysteric or you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a lunatic. If you say that, um, you know, there's a lot of people right now getting in trouble for uh, criticizing puberty blockers for children that are identifying as trans, saying that there's, you know, they're, they're questioning the, the um, uh, you know, rationale for prescribing uh, very strong drugs to children who are going through uh, a gender identity crisis. There are people that are, that I remember when Adderall came out and Ritalin, people were going, wait a minute, should we be medicating children in the way that we are medicating them? And often I have seen uh, throughout my life, whether it's anxiety or depression, we are a heavily medicated country. Um, mm -hmm. The root causes of, of most of those issues, anxiety or depression, a lot of times they can be uh, situational. A lot of times they have to do with diet. A lot of times they have to do with hormonal things people are going through that they just don't understand. Um, and we dismiss all of that, and our answer for everything is a pill. And that, to me, has been... I've always been skeptical of that. And anybody who questions that, we don't really... The pharmaceutical industry is something that we barely uh, understand their power. They have a ton of power. We always talk about yeah. the national security state or oil and gas or whatever, but or tech. But pharmaceutical industry is... They're big dogs, and they usually get their way. Well, yeah, and they're also tied to the national security state as well. It's worth pointing out, like Donald Rumsfeld, before he was Secretary of Defense for uh, George W. Bush, was head of a major uh, pharmaceutical company, Gilead. Um, right. <laughs> and right. Been, it was basically in this revolving door between the Pentagon and, and big. That's an interesting overlapping skill set to have. You are yeah, the CEO yeah. of a pharmaceutical company, and then you're the Secretary of Defense. Yeah. Odd. Yeah. Well, it is a little odd. Um, I wonder if the Pope, re back, remember the Pope who sorry. resigned? It would be funny if the Pope who resigned, I forget his name, was now just like the CEO of AstraZeneca. Like a Pope, like a, <laughs> has a Pope ever gone into being the CEO of a pharmaceutical company? Soon we'll have yeah. that. We'll have ex-Pope now leads Gilead. Whitney Webb, thank you so much. Unlimitedhangout.com, Rockfin, to, to, to listen to what, the podcast? Yeah, I have a podcast on there and I have some video stuff. Um, there's so much material coming out every day about the crazy Orwellian uh, crap that is going on. Uh, yeah. A lot of it behind the scenes and doesn't get coverage. So I'm probably going to have to move to video or some other stuff to get some of these smaller stories out more quickly because uh, writing does take a lot of time. And I also just, uh, you know, moved 8,000 miles across the planet. <laughs> right. Well, so, we, appre we yeah. always appreciate you coming on. We'll have you back on uh, during the trial. Let's see if we get to the trial of Ghislaine. We'll have a special yeah. Whitney Webb uh, exclusive trial. Maybe we can watch the trial. Do you think that there's no way there's cameras in the courtroom, right? No way. No. Well, they haven't even allowed. A, there's still no mugshot of Ghislaine. I, right. I really doubt they're going to let um, a, you know a big public presence of any sort uh, in in her trial, or if it'll even be in person. Uh, most of her, uh, you know, um, litigation so far, and she's been you know present via Zoom and stuff like that. So we'll yeah, see. she'll be um, out in a few years, and she'll be running a pharmaceutical company, probably, and to, <laughs> and. She'll be telling you or about the tech yeah. companies with her sister. Yeah. Um, I think I've mentioned this before. You her have, sister yeah. Isabel is the technology pioneer of the World Economic Forum, yeah. which is uh, behind a lot of this stuff. So well, I'm sure she'll find a place a, to work. They're a fun family, and I'm sure Ghislaine will be out there telling you about the importance of vaccine passports. Whitney Webb, thank you again. Everybody that likes what Whitney does, go support her on her website, Unlimited Hangout, and on Rockfin. And uh, we're, we're glad you're, you're still out there raking up mock. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you, Whitney. You.